dum, dum, what to say to Lord, it's dum, dum, you who gave me life and I dum, can't explain dum, just how dum, dum, much you mean to me now dum, dum, that you would say me, Lord, dum, dum, I give all that I am to you dum, dum, every day, I will, dum, dum, I'll be a light that shines your dum, name. Be a light up to the world every day. It's you I live for every day. I'll follow after you every day. I'll walk with you, my Lord. Every day, Lord, I'll, I'll learn to stand up on your word. And I pray that I, that I might come to know you more. That you will guide me. Every single step I take and every day I will I'll be a light up to the world every day It's you I live for every day I'll follow after you every day I'll walk with you my Lord Sing every day, every day It's you I live for
enthroned on our praise arise King of Kings Holy God as we sing arise 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 please take your place be enthroned on our praise arise King of Kings Thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy Thanks to the Lord, call on his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name.
light Broke through my night Restored exceeding joy Your grace fell like the rain And made this desert live You have turned My morning into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy You have turned My morning into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy Your hand lifted me up I stand on higher ground Your praise rose in my heart And made this valley sing You have turned My morning into dancing You have turned my sorrow into joy You have turned My morning into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy This is how we into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy You have turned My morning into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy This is how we into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy You have turned My morning into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy This is how we overcome This is how we
to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a new revival, stirring as we pray and sing. We're on our knees, we're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Good morning. Today I'll be reading John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we ha have all received grace in a place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself in God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Good morning, church. We're glad that you are here to worship with us today in spirit and in truth. Uh, it's been a great month off, but I'm excited to see you again. I'm excited to worship with you again. I'm hoping that we'll be in person soon, but we thank you for your flexibility at this time uh, while we deal with this uh, virus. Uh, just a few announcements, things that we need to make known to you. There's not a whole lot right now, but just uh, a reminder that we will not have in-person worship for the month of December. We'll continue to meet virtually the way we are doing right now at 1015 uh, a.m. So split, spread that word to, to friends and family that might not be on our Facebook page or receiving emails. Also, we will... If we are going to do a Christmas Eve service, we're going to do that virtually some, somehow as well. We're thinking about just putting out a video on our church, book, church Facebook page in which you can just watch at any time, whether you want to watch that on Christmas Eve or on Christmas. But stay tuned uh, for that. Also, for those are asking about uh, small groups or e-groups, uh, we want to let you police those, and so group leaders be in contact with your groups, be making a plan for whether you want to meet this month, how you want to meet, or if you're taking the month off, uh, set up a plan for when you're going to be getting back together. So all those things we want to let you police yourself, so uh, be in contact with one another. For our call to worship, I want us to be thinking about this idea of incarnation, uh, it's something I'm going to be bringing up in the sermon. We're going to be talking about what does it mean for Jesus to be incarnated, to, to be God in the flesh. But I want to share a story about uh, incarnation, maybe help us understand it a little bit better, that comes from the great Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey says, On one raw winter night, a man heard an irregular thumping 
a sound against his kitchen storm door. And he went to the window and he watched as tiny sparrows were shivering and they were attracted to the warmth inside and they beat vainly against the glass. So touched, the farmer bundled up and he trudged through the snow and went out to his barn and he opened the barn doors for the struggling birds. And he turned on the lights and he tossed some hay in the corner and he sprinkled a trail of salting crackers to direct them into the barn. But the sparrows, which had scattered in all directions when he emerged from the house, they were still in the darkness and they were afraid of him and they wouldn't go in. So he tried various tactics, circling behind the birds to drive them towards the barn doors. He tried tossing some crackers in the air towards the barn to see if they would follow that, but nothing worked. He, this huge alien creature, had terrified them, and the birds could not understand that he actually was there and he desired to help. So he withdrew to the house, thinking that maybe if he watched through the window, the sparrows would enter on their own. As he stared, a thought hit him like lightning from a clear blue sky. If only I could become a bird, one of them just for a moment, then I wouldn't frighten them so. I could show them the way to warmth and to safety. And at the same moment, another thought dawned on him. He had grasped the whole principle of the incarnation. A man's becoming a bird is nothing compared to God's becoming a man. The concept of a sovereign being as big as the universe he created, confining himself to a human body, was and is too much for some people to believe. Yet it's true. It's true. God came in the flesh. Jesus left his place in heaven and became a human being, 100% human and 100% God, living as that perfect life for us as that example for us, and then dying as that sacrifice for us so that we could have life and eternity with him. So as we worship this morning, thinking about Jesus Christ in the flesh, fully human and fully God, let us give glory and honor and praise to the wonder that is Jesus Christ. And let us worship through the spirit which Jesus left as a deposit for us. And let us lift up our voice to our creator. Let's set the world in motion. Let's worship church. As the deer thirsts for the water, Lord, Lord, so my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you.
Let's pray. Father God, we come before you humbled, realizing that we are sinful, that we are lost without you. Father, we need you in every aspect of our life, not just coming here, sitting on our couch, watching a pre-recorded service, worshiping you. We need you in everything, living, breathing, working, interacting with others. For without you, we are truly a lost cause. Father, we thank you for all of your blessings, a roof over our head, heat, food, a bed to sleep in, clothes to wear, clean drinking water. Lord, you are absolutely wonderfully generous. And I pray that as we enter the season of giving, that we would be as generous as you are, that we would be as giving as you are. And I pray that you would help us to be a blessing to those around us. And that we wouldn't see what we can get out of others, but that we would see what we could do for others. I pray that you would help us to model our giving in such a way that it resembles your sacrifice, you giving everything. We thank you for that sacrifice. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the Just 
For our communion thoughts today, I'll be reading a few passages of scripture from the beginning of the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, Nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the life of all mankind. The light, that is Jesus, shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There's just so much that's packed into these first five verses of John. The statement, in him was life, and that life was the life of all mankind, just means that he instilled within us, within all of us, the capacity to be one with him, to be in a relationship with him. We're hardwired with this ability. Of course, with any ability he has gifted us, it's not forced upon us to use it. It must be our choice. Jesus made it possible for us to be in relationship with him, to be family forever because of the cross. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we just open our hearts up to you. The love that was demonstrated to us and continues to be outpoured toward us because of the cross is just too much for us to comprehend. But yet, Father, we are thankful 
And because of that thankfulness, Father, we try to live in obedience to you. And even though we stumble and fall often, you're there to pick us back up and to love us and to guide us. As we take this fruit of the vine, Father, may our thoughts go back to the scene on the cross where Jesus' blood was spilled. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Continuing our prayer, Holy Father, we thank you again for the life that was given to us through your Son. As we take this cup, Father, we pray that we consume it and let it consume us with the love and mercy and grace that was given. In Jesus' name. As part of our service, we, um, and part of our praise and worship to God, the Father, and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. We take time to uh, give back to what he has richly blessed us with. This time that we uh, give um, some of what he has uh, allowed us to steward, I'd like to read from Mark 12 to put it into pr proper perspective. Mark 12, beginning in verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, only worth a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This account has profound significance in how Jesus views our giving. As we take this opportunity to give back, I want us to take away from scripture these two very important points. One, Jesus values and models sacrifice. And number two, our giving does matter. There's a way that's been provided um, online a link that you can click on uh, if you wish to give. Let us pray. Father, again, we honor you with what we have to bring to you, the gifts that we bring to you. Father, may these funds be used to further your kingdom, to encourage others. And Father, help us to Give sacrificially, give in a way that models the poor widow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. 
He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands for victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Good morning. We're going to start a new sermon series today called In. A small word with two small letters, I and In. Think about how much of your life has been devoted to being in, to being included, to being involved, to be invited, to be a part of the in crowd. Because let's face it, we all want to be in. Nobody wants to be left out. I was thinking about the first time that I really felt excluded, the first time I really felt left out in life and how it hurt me. It sounds like a small little thing, but I was six years old watching my favorite program on television, a television called Romper Room from 1984. And as I'm sitting there on my living room floor watching Romper Room, at the end of each episode, Miss Molly would come on and she would say something like this. We now return to Romper Room Friends. Hi, friends. Well, I had a good day today, and I'd really like to thank you, Rick, for coming to You're Romper very Room. You're welcome. I love being here. I enjoyed learning all about the magic tricks, and we can try that, too. And do you know, I've got a little bit of magic of my own. I'm going to see my friends in the magic mirror. Romper bomper, stomper boo, tell me, tell me, tell me do. Magic mirror, tell me today, did all my friends have fun at play? All my friends had fun today. I see Barley. She's having a special day today, and so is Annie. And so is Neil and Lenora and Janine and Vanessa. They're all having special days. And Bridget had a special day last Thursday, and Kim had one last Friday. And Nicole's having a special day today. And Joseph had one last Thursday. And I see Renee, Elise, and Nicole Lynn, and Elise Marie. They're all having special days today. And so is Stacy, Jennifer, and Tara Ann, and I see Betsy. And I'll see you again. Bye-bye, friends. After 
after each episode, she would go through that magic mirror and she would mention everybody's name, but I never heard my name. She mentioned Barley, she mentioned Renee Elise, and she missed, mentioned Elise Marie, but never Daryl. Why do we need two Elises? You know, why didn't I ever hear my name? Now, I ended up cracking the code as an adult and realized that those special days that she was talking about were birthdays, and usually mom and dad would write or call in to have their child's name added, but never heard my name. And it sounds kind of silly, but I do remember thinking, why am I not seen? Because I really thought that that was a magic mirror that she could look out and see children in the audience at home. Why wasn't I seen? Why wasn't I included? Nobody wants to be left out. You know, we think about even being on these Zoom calls that we have today. Maybe you realize it as a student or even as a, a person that goes to work and you got to log in for all these meetings and you don't have the right code or the right password for your Microsoft Teams or your Zoom account. And so you can't log in, so therefore you are left out. I remember last spring, one of my children was, was trying to get into the, the Zoom meeting, but the teacher have to, has to accept you, has to let you into the meeting. So they were just sitting there quietly, feeling left out, needing to get in. And that's the way each one of us feel, if we're honest, so many times. And we put our time and our energy and our worries into making sure that we are not being left out. Perhaps that's why I fell in love with Jesus at a very early age. Jesus has never made me feel left out. I have always felt that God has wanted me to be a part of his life, that God created me for that relationship with him. If you think about it, God always wants you to be in with him. He wants you to be in relationship. He wants you to be in community. He wants you to be in communication through prayer. He wants you to be in fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants you to be in love with him as he is in love with you. God offers you and me everything through Christ. But we learn through the Gospels that our invitation and our inclusion into the kingdom of God came at a very costly price. The Gospels are love letters to us where Jesus proclaims, I love you. I want you to live with me eternally. And the Gospels share the incredible all-in story of Jesus. You know, we often think about the all-in sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And that's so very true. How do you just partially or kind of give your life for somebody? It's either all or nothing. And that's what makes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus so special. But I want to draw us back to the birth of Christ to think about the all-in commitment it took for Jesus to decide I'm going to leave heaven and I'm going to come down to save my people. And when we go to the book of John, John chapter 1 and verse 14, which was our scripture reading for this morning, we see these very important words of John because they are helping shape and define the Christology or the, the theology of Jesus and who he is and what he was made of and why he even came to this earth. And so a lot of times, you'll, you'll hear me say this all, all over uh, through the year. We'll come back to John chapter 1, verse 14, because it's so important. And what do the words say? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and full of truth. So let's go back and unpack that first part of verse 14. John says, the word became flesh. There's another word for that that starts with I-N. The Latin word for this kind of term would be incarnation. 
I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up hearing that word incarnation. I thought incarnation was some kind of form of instant breakfast. So someone, you know, what's the incarnation? It's like, you know, I'll take chocolate. Incarnation, what is that? Incarnation is just the Latin word in and carno, and carno means flesh or meat. So when it says the word became flesh, Jesus became a human being. His DNA of being God was merged and combined with the DNA of humanity. So he didn't just drop himself into a shell of a body. He was 100% God and 100% human. Now, I, I don't pretend to understand all about that. I have so many questions. When I get to heaven, my second question is going to be, God, why did you create cats? But my first question is going to be, Lord, would you explain the incarnation to me? But Jesus had to come as a fully human being, but he also had to be fully God. You know, the next part is, it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We tend to understand the word indwelling a little bit better, but sometimes we use indwelling and incarnation interchangeably, and they're not the same words. Indwelling is different. It means to, to live among or to make your home in. And so if we think that God just was indwelled into a human being, it's kind of like you you dropped him into a person, but he's, he's fully God and he's just walking around in a shell. But that doesn't make Jesus like us in every way. We need someone that's tempted and tried the way that we are, someone that suffers the way that we do. I mean, think about this. If Jesus were living here today, his human body would be as susceptible to the coronavirus as all of us. Jesus was fully human and fully God. To indwell in something is different. Like I said, it's to live among or to make your home in. Now, indwelling is very important. We have the spirit indwelling in us as these Jesus followers. But because we have the spirit in us, that does not make us the spirit. But we try to live by the spirit and through the spirit. And so... If Jesus is living in us, we are not Jesus, but we are living through Christ. Christ is indwelling in us. But when when Jesus was incarnated, he became the very flesh of that human body. And so you ask, why, Daryl, are you making such a big deal about this? Why is it so important that we think about incarnation? Who cares? Why don't we just get on with the next lesson? Well, let me tell you why it's so important. John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. Now, we've talked about this before. This idea of glory is tabernacle language. When the people of the Old Testament, when the Israelites wanted to see God or feel his presence in the Old Testament, they would go to the tabernacle or later to the temple, and that would be where the glory of God would dwell. And there were times when the glory of God would be in a a pillar of smoke or a pillar of fire, or maybe you'd see it in a burning bush. But the glory of God was not something that you could look upon directly or even touch. I want you to go with me to this awesome story in Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, this is right after we have the story of the golden calf, which most of you are probably familiar with. Moses is on the mountain with God for 40 days, receiving the Ten Commandments. And what are the Israelites doing? They're down at the bottom of the mountain, making a a God for themselves, which they can feel and see and touch, but they've made with their own hands. But now in Exodus 33, Moses is having a heart-to-heart with the Lord. And Moses says to the Lord in verse 12, You have been telling me to lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. 
And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Sounds very comforting, doesn't it? Yet Moses is not very comforted. Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us up from here. So God had just said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And it's like Moses didn't even hear him. He's like, yeah, but if your presence isn't going to go, then don't send us here. Don't lead us out. And the Lord says again to Moses in verse 17, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. That's still not good enough for Moses because Moses now says in verse 18, now show me your glory. I think Moses feels like he's on the out. Even though that God has been telling this whole time, Moses, you're on the in. You and I are close. I am in your presence. You are in my presence. And I am going to give you rest. But Moses is feeling on the out and he says, I need something more. I need you to show me your glory. It's like he's saying, I need something tangible to see or to touch to know that you are real. And this is where we have this awesome passage about how the Lord says, I will pass by and you can look upon my back, but you cannot see me face to face or you will die because I am so holy. I want you to think about what Jesus means when we think about incarnation where God becomes flesh. It gives us a way to see and to touch and to to have a tangible God. God in the flesh. Think about how special Jesus Christ is. No one could touch God and live. No one could look on the face of God and live. And now after Jesus comes to this earth, he's fully God, but now he's also fully human We have little children sitting on the lap of the Son of God. We have people sitting around breaking bread with the Son of God. We have a woman in Luke chapter 8, one of my favorite stories. Luke chapter 8, Jesus is on the way to heal Jairus, the synagogue ruler's daughter. She's 12 years old and she's dying. And as Jesus is on his way, there is such a large crowd that it says it is pressing in against him. And Jesus says, who touched me? He looks around and no one is fessing up to who touched him. And finally the disciples say, you know, there's a really big crowd here, Lord. Everybody is touching everybody. But Jesus says, no, I felt my power leave me. And then we see this woman fesses up to what she has done in Luke chapter 8, verse 47. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. Why is she trembling? Because what is human just touched what is holy. Because what is unclean just touched what is clean. You think about it, for 12 years, this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years has never been deemed clean so that she can go worship in the temple. You think it's bad to have to be away from worship for a couple of months? We at least have online, but hopefully we'll come back together really soon. This woman has not been able to participate in worship, at least in the communal sense, for 12 years because she is unclean because she is constantly in contact with blood. And now that she sees the Savior, now that she sees God in the flesh, she reaches out to touch him. And what is human comes into contact with what is holy. And not only does she not die, she is healed. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then Jesus said to her, daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Why did Jesus have to come in the flesh? Why did he have to be fully human but still remain fully God? Well, the divine spirit 
joined with human flesh so that human flesh could join with the divine spirit. I love it. I love it. A holy God found a way to interact with humanity for us to be in his presence. The glory of God was seen and touched through the personhood of Jesus. Have you ever been insulted by someone trying to assume your feelings and your circumstances when you know that they have never experienced it themselves? Maybe you're going through cancer or maybe you're sick with something that you know that they haven't experienced and they they try to sympathize or they try to say they know how you're feeling and you actually, you you get pretty resentful and you get pretty angry because there's no way they can know what you are going through. I want you to imagine if Jesus didn't come in the flesh but he came down and, and maybe took on like an image of a human being but he wasn't tempted in the ways we were. He, he didn't get sick. He never, was t- he never had any of these problems that you and I have. And, and Jesus comes to us and says, I know what you're going through. You know what a lot of people probably would have said to him? You have no idea. How do you know? You were never a human being. You've never had these, these issues of the flesh. I think we need the incarnation of Jesus more than we've ever realized or known. We need a Christ, a king who can sympathize with us because he has been tempted in every way. Don't you just love Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, which says, We don't have a high priest who can't empathize with us, but we have a high priest who can empathize with us because he has been tempted in every way and he knows all of our weaknesses because he has been tempted in those ways himself, yet he did not sin. Jesus wants you in with him because he knows the pain of being on the outs. Jesus is in with the lonely. Jesus is in with the outcast. Jesus is in with the poor. Jesus is in with the hurting. Why? Because Jesus can relate, not only from a God level, but from a human level, because he was all those things himself. But let me say this as we close. Jesus wanting you in doesn't mean anything goes. I'm not preaching a sermon this morning about universalism, this idea that all roads lead to heaven, that that no one will end up in hell. I would love to say that all roads do lead to heaven, that no one will go to hell, but that's not what Scripture says. Because if you look at the last part of John chapter 1, verse 14, it talks about the word coming in flesh, make his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory. But the end of verse 14 says that he is full of grace, and truth, meaning he offers grace to all, but you have to be willing to accept that he is the truth, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus wants you in, but it's your choice to accept his conditions. It's your choice whether you want to change in to your wedding clothes. It's your choice whether you want to be transformed into his image through his spirit. As he has gone all in for you, I ask you this question as we close. Are you willing to go all in for him? Let me put it to you this way. Jesus offers you this invitation. Come as you are, leave as I am. Everyone is invited to come as you are, to lay down your baggage, to lay down your burdens. Jesus wants you in, but we have to leave and go out as he is. The incarnation, it's a big deal. God in the flesh, 100% God, 100% human. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about what it means to be in the spirit, 
as we've talked about what it means to be in the flesh. We're going to talk about what it means to be in community with God and with others. And we're going to talk about what it means to have Christ in us so that we can be in the world, that light shining in darkness. I wish we could be in person together this morning. And though we can't be, I want to offer you the invitation of Jesus. Come as you are, leave as he is. Until next week, I pray that God blesses you richly and that you will go out into the world and be light amidst darkness. Have a good week. church family. It's good to have you with us again this morning to meet at the Church of Christ here at Oakdale. We always greet our visitors, whether it's online or in person, and tell you how much we appreciate you coming and worshiping with us. And we also want to extend that invitation that sometime after the first of the year in 2021, that you'll come and visit our building and visit us and give us a chance to greet you in person. Yes, this is going to be our format for the month of December. We're going to be streaming online for the entire month. And yes, later in the month of December, we're going to reevaluate the situation and make decisions concerning what will be taking place following the first of the year. There's one family I want to mention this before we have our prayer, our closing prayer this morning. And that is uh, Piper Riggs. Her father, Brian Johnson, had surgery this afternoon. He had some complications before the surgery, but he's doing well this afternoon, and they're very pleased with the way that the uh, procedure went. So we want to keep her family in our prayers. We are blessed. I'd like to share a quick little anecdote, a little, little uh, story that I ran across with you. There's a young lady, and I call her young because she's younger than I am, who's a nurse. 
And back in the middle of the pandemic, when it was really bad in New York, she went up there and spent six weeks. And she was in the hospitals there when that large military hospital ship came into New York Harbor to anchor and to try to meet needs if they were necessary at that time. Well, she came home, and she came home healthy, and now she's in a small community in southwest Kansas. And the other night, while Kim Langford was on the floor, a woman came in with internal bleeding. Always a serious sign. Immediately they were trying to take measures to meet whatever her problem was. Unfortunately, all of the ICU beds were full. Now this is a small, small rural hospital that special people have made an effort to keep this type of facility open in about a 1,500 population community. They called around to see if they could transfer her to another facility. They found out that the nearest facility was Denver, Colorado. Four hour drive, driving right below the radar or having her care flight to Denver. Pretty tough decisions to have to make. Fortunately, because of her expertise in third world nursing, she was able to help the patient and get the patient stabilized, and then they were able to make other arrangements. So this pandemic is hitting all over the country, and especially here in flyover country and parts of rural states where they're facing real challenges as well as those of us in the larger communities. We are blessed, and sometimes it's hard for us to appreciate the blessings that we have. Appreciate Lance's prayer that he did earlier, where he talked about how richly blessed we are, better than we deserve, and how you, the love of our Father is continually flowing down on us. And yes, flowing down on us even when times are difficult and hard. Will you pray with me, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the thoughts that Lance has put before your throne. We continue to ask, Father, that you help us to get through each day and to face it with the positive attitude knowing that you are with us. And that's what your word, your inspired word has taught us, to take each day one at a time. Tomorrow has its own sorrows and has its own problems, but let's take today. So, Father, may we keep that teaching from your word in our minds and hearts as we deal through this second round of illness that is striking our state and our country. Father, it is so good to know that the creator of this earth and all the galaxies and universes throughout the heavens wants the very best for us and will always stand beside us and will love us even when we're not very lovable. It's hard to imagine a love like that, Father, that you give to us. And then you would send your son to die for us. Thank you for so many good things. Be with those that are fighting this illness. Be with those whose families are in distress because of all that's taking place. And we also want to remember those who have lost loved ones as a result of this. And let us not forget that there are other illnesses going on, other procedures taking place. So we need to keep all of these in mind at this time. Thank you, Father, that we're not alone. Thank you for giving us the Spirit to indwell with us and to allow us to grow spiritually and to be able to utter our petitions before your throne. And then, of course, Father, most, most importantly, we thank you for the wonderful gift of Jesus and what it means to all of your baptized believers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was hurting all along. I was searching for a comfort I could find on my own With no direction Feeling down My life was headed for disaster Till you turned me around Nothing ever had been able to ease me When trying
trying to please me It only pleased me less But when I learned about the way that you love me Had to put your honor above me And you gave me rest Lead me to rest 